pediatric ankle injuries, not, not only the fractures. Um, I'm Walid Kisht, I'm assistant professor uh, uh, pediatric orthopedic at McMaster University here in Hamilton, Canada. I just finished my clinic. I know it's a Friday in Egypt, uh, but it's working day here. Um, so I, I know you enjoy Friday more than us. Um, actually, most of my practice is uh, pediatric foot, which is very interesting, um, interesting practice. Uh, we see a lot of pediatric uh, foot deformities. Uh, now I see a lot of more uh, sport injuries, maybe more in Canada. I know in Egypt, uh, injuries around the ankle are, are very aggressive. Uh, kids are, are more monkey, but, um, but I see a lot of interesting uh, foot and ankle injuries right now. Um, I, I'm going to start with this uh, article that we published uh, four years ago now, um, uh, since I was in, in London at Western. So, uh, so we made this article to come out with a classification uh, for pediatric uh, lower extremity or lower upper extremity injuries based on the secondary ossification centers. Uh, try to make things easy. Uh, so we came out with this classification, uh, classifying the injuries based on the ossification uh, because we found the ossification of the secondary ossification center is a good sign on the X-ray. So for example, pre-ossification uh, is more common to have non-accidental trauma or child abuse, especially around the elbow. And, um, and the way to roll out uh, that if you get the diagnosis, the X-ray, that's fine. If not, we'll get uh, an arthrogram or an MRI or some centers are good with ultrasound. When they get the ossification, uh, it's, it's easy to see the fracture, but sometimes you can miss it. The, the best example for this is an elbow dislocation while you get the medial epicondyle evulsion fracture incarcerated in the elbow, and that's commonly missed even after reduction. And uh, that's another entity. Then uh, we classified the third group as a pre-fusion uh, group, or some people like to call it the transitional uh, fracture, which is the most common for the ankle injury is a transitional ankle fracture. Uh, also the apophyseal fractures, like Dr. Well Nasser talk about the apophyseal injuries around the proximal tibia, also the evulsions, um, most commonly around the pelvis. Uh, these are common entities happen at the age of uh, around the puberty. It's very interesting. We also published uh, another paper about a, a anterior superior LX spine fracture and anterior inferior LX spine. And uh, we did a review article about uh, the age and the mechanism of injury. It was very interesting. It's in a GBGS uh, case connector. And, and by the way, this study is uh, open access. So feel free to, uh, to read the study. We put an example of uh, every entity based on the ossification sensor. So now moving to the ankle. The ankle joint, as you all know, has, uh, is formed by tibia, uh, fibula articulating with the talus. Uh, talus is very special bone. Uh, I, I was hoping that uh, I can, uh, I could have time, have a talus uh, case fracture in a children. I know it's very rare. Uh, I know Dr. Lewindy did the talus fracture in adults last week. Uh, and I had, uh, I had in, in my practice only three patients in, in a children with a talus fracture. But talus is very interesting, mostly articular um, and um, has no muscle attachment and, uh, and very important bone. It's very sensitive, has mostly cartilage, uh, weight bearing area, uh, mostly broad at the uh, posterior, uh, has a neck talus, famous with uh, AVN and um, and the articulation with the tibia is a hinged uh, joint. There are the rest of the anatomy. We all know that medial malleolus, lateral malleolus, and the ligaments around the uh, anterior. Uh, this is from the posterior view. This is the posterior talofibular ligament. And the calcaneofibular ligament, that's from the back. Looking from uh, the sides, also we know the deltoid ligament uh, uh, from the anterior ATFL anterior talofibular ligament, and uh, from the posterior, we have the posterior talofibular ligament, and uh, also the calcaneofibular ligament, and then the interosseous uh, 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 talocalcaneal ligament as well. Uh, rest of the anatomy, as we all know, uh, movements, uh, 
principal muscle for dorsiflexion and the plantar flexion. Um, so physial uh, considerations. The distal tibial physis uh, accounts for uh, 35 to 40% of overall tibial growth and about 20, 15 to 20% of the lower extremity growth. Uh, the growth rate is about three to four millimeters uh, per year, and it continues to age of 14 in, in female and 16 in, uh, in boys or in male. Closure occurs uh, during uh, an 18 month at the transitional uh, period. That's why we call it the transition uh, fractures around the ankle. The distal fibular physis continue to, to, to grow uh, 12 to 24 months uh, after closure of the distal uh, tibial physis. This is very important to understand the growth and also the direction of, of closure of the growth plate of the distal tibia. Uh, that also make us uh, understanding how the fractures are specific to the distal tibia. Um, so um, the, the start of closure uh, starting from the medial side, going to the center. So the last part to fuse is this lateral part. And this will explain why we see the tail of fracture uh, commonly at this age of group between 13 and 14. Sometimes I see it very rarely under the age of 12, but this is extremely rare. Um, I know that Dr. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Mohammed Hagazi uh, talk about the Salter Hess classification. Yeah, Professor uh, Mohammed Osama Hagazi. Dr. Mohammed Osama Hagazi. Yeah. Uh, to, um, and, and you know Salter Hess type one, type two, type three. It's it's intra it's epiphyseal type four, including epiphyseal metaphyseal, and type five is uh, the crushing one through the uh, the epiphysis. And that came by Dr. Salter in uh, in Toronto. He's just my neighbor here. Um, incidence, uh, the distal, distal uh, tibial physial injury is the second most common, it's 25 to 40%, and accounts uh, for 55% of the pediatric fractures. It's more common in males, uh, as usual, and uh, typically happen between 8 to 15 years. Although I see, like recently I've seen one uh, four years old had uh, distal of um, distal epiphyseal fracture, but uh, that's extremely rare. Uh, risk factors, sports uh, participation increase, the BMI, sorry, I uh, missed the high, but, uh, and the third one is the foot deformity. Uh, we see a lot of ankle injuries around uh, capovarous foot or uh, flat foot, or some people with uh, coalitions, uh, either with flat foot or not. Um, it's mechanism of injuries, uh, that's a classification came by Tachian, uh, supination inversion, supination external rotation, or pronation eversion uh, with external rotation or supination with plantar flexion. That's a Tachian classification with dias. Um, usually you get the usual imaging, AP mortis, lateral, three views for the ankle, and um, uh, Optional views, which I, I always prefer uh, to get the full length of the tibia uh, to roll out mesonaves uh, type of injury, or uh, sometimes I've seen missed proximal tibia fracture in kids, which is very common. And we know it's common with the causing causing phenomena and ZCOM uh, with, with pain and the emergency doctor saying, I, I couldn't see any fracture on the distal tibia while they're taking only x-ray around the ankle. Then we do the full tibia, you see a proximal tibia fracture. I've seen this a couple of times. CT scan, uh, the, it's an important tool to assess a fracture uh, displacement and it's also uh, good for the preoperative planning. There's ankle serious uh, AP mortis and uh, lateral view. Um, Let's talk about the tail of fracture. Uh, we just mentioned that closure starts at the medial side and the lateral side still unfused uh, that, that make it in a weak situation uh, that with, with the injury can cause Salter Harris three fracture at this lateral aspect, especially anterior. And we know this is attached to the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament 
and that mostly can uh, cause evolution of, uh, of this piece of bone. It happens in three to 5% pediatric ankle fractures, more common in girls, which is, uh, it's actually, this is what I see, seen in children near uh, skeletal maturity between 12 and 14, and typically occur within one year of complete distal tibial physial closure um, due to the pattern we'll talk about. Um, and this age group is quite older than the triplane fracture age group that we're going to talk about now. Uh, mechanism of injury usually is supination external rotation injury and causes uh, evulsion. And uh, associated fracture can be the uh, distal fibular fracture, Salter has one or two, and epsilateral uh, tibial shaft fracture can happen. That's why we, we need to get a full tibial uh, x ray. Uh, CT scan uh, can show us a fracture pattern and uh, also rule out any associated malleolar fracture. Treatment, uh, so some do close the reduction pinning using uh, a KOR as a joystick um, and then use a cannulated screws. Um, and the question, the common question, is it okay at this age group to cross suffices with a screw or not? Uh, I personally, if the patient uh, is around 12 or 13, I don't cross suffices. If the patient comes at the age of 14, especially female, and uh, have difficulty getting the screw and the physis, I can, I can cross the physis. I don't have any issues with the growth remaining. Uh, talking to the point of closed reduction versus open reduction, uh, keep in mind this is an interarticular fracture. And, um, and sometimes it gets uh, it's a periosteum entrapped and, and most of the time you need to go inside, take the periosteum out and to get a perfect reduction, this is my favorite way to do. The other way uh, is uh, I recently started to do more as I do arthroscopic guided reduction. So I get the advantage of minimal invasive closed reduction plus arthroscopic guided. And uh, that give me also better view for uh, any associated interarticular cartilaginous injury and, um, and show me that the reduction is perfect as I need it. Uh, using the floor as well with the spool. For the open reduction, it's usually an anterolateral approach to visualize the joint line, uh, remove any uh, periosteum entrapped, uh, can do arthroscopic assist assisted uh, reduction as we mentioned, and uh, we can do the indirect reduction with periarticular clamp. Uh, screws are cannulated screws, usually use 4.0 uh, if if can take 4.5, that's fine. Uh, 4.2 usually uh, is enough, and one screw is usually enough. Do your best to be a BPCL, uh, but if uh, the patient is close to uh, finish his uh, growth um, and it's difficult to get the, the shot for the BPCL uh, screw, uh, it's okay to cross suffices uh, in older kids. Say in older. Uh, is about 14 in female and in about 15 in, in boys. Um, so we use the intra-articular, intra physical cannulate screws 4.0 and um, we'll keep them. Uh, what what I, I used to do right now is quite different is I keep them in a slab for two weeks and then uh, I put them in an air boot after two weeks, non-weight bearing still. Uh, for a total of six weeks, but the advantage of air cast is it's removable. So they can get range of motion of their ankle to avoid the stiffness and also avoid significant calf atrophy. The triplane fracture, which is very specific as well, and uh, um, is, is seen in children between the age of 10 to 17, and it's characterized by a complex Salter Harris 4 fracture. It's so hard to understand this fracture, uh, but we'll try to make it easy. So with a triplane um, to, to diagnose, so the incidence is 5 to 15%, and it's more common in, in male uh, that uh, compared to the TLO fracture we just talked about, and occur in children uh, during their physial closure. So their average is younger than TLO. And, um, and as we know, is uh, 
the juvenile ankle physis ossifies in a specific order uh, that leads to trans transitional fracture. This is what we talk about. The start closure from medial uh, to the center, leaving the lateral intact. Um, that's why this, this is younger than the telo fracture. Mechanism of injury, uh, there are two types, lateral and medial triplane. Uh, the lateral triplane, usually supination, external rotation, uh, usually medial triplane, similar to adult, it's an adduction uh, injury. Uh, can be three, two, three, or four part fracture. Um, is the epiphysis is often uh, fractured on the lateral aspect. Uh, in the sagittal plane, and the physis is uh, separated in the axial plane, and the metaphysis fractured in the posterior ax aspect in the coronal plane and is seen in the lateral radiogram. It's very confusing. So let's make it for easy for the juniors. Uh, you will see in the AP view, uh, Salter has three fracture of the epiphysis. In the lateral view, you see Salter has two fracture of the metaphysis. Um, that makes sense. So, and it's all one fracture. In total, it's Salter Harris 4, but because it's triplane and a spiral and it's going through the physis, uh, the way to diagnose it, you see two fractures one uh, vertical in the epiphysis in the AP, and one uh, sagittal metaphysial on the lateral view. So, here is an example for uh, a fracture. It's more medial. So, is there is, it's kind of um, uh, oblique. Uh, so you see the vertical fracture in here. Going through the physis is also fibular fracture. And the lateral view, there is a kind of small metaphysial fracture there. So AB, vertical fracture in the abephysis, lateral uh, fracture, metaphysial, metaphysial fracture. That's a triplane. This, they're all connected together through the physis. Um, CT scan is helpful uh, because sometimes it, it, it looks, gives you more detail and it looks worse than what we think. And uh, usually I like to do the CT scan uh, after trial of reduction. I will do the reduction opposite to the mechanism of injury. And as we said, if it's external rotation, lateral fracture, we do internal rotation for the reduction. Uh, so I start with pulling down internal rotation and some dorsiflexion. Uh, if you look at the axial CT, it looks like a Mercedes-Benz sign. Not sure if you like Mercedes or BMW, but uh, Mercedes-Benz sign is very common in, around the ankle. Uh, surgical treatment. Uh, so try close reduction first. Uh, if the gap is less than two millimeters, especially for the interarticular, you don't see any tell. Uh, that means there is no uh, periosteum entrapped inside, maybe successful. Uh, it's better to follow the CT scan to assess your reduction. Um, if not, go for surgical treatment. Uh, the best uh, thing is open reduction, internal fixation for me. I know there are some studies we'll just talk about now, talking about uh, minimal invasive closed reduction, pinning or screws. Um, but still, the, the standard of care is open reduction. This is intraarticular fracture, plus it's, it's physial injury. Uh, try to make it as perfect as you can to get the reduced uh, articular surface and, uh, and fix it. That fixation is easy with a cannulated screw. And uh, you might add a metaphysial fixation with the screws as well. For the, for the lateral uh, triplane, anterolateral approach, uh, so you can, can get you to approach the intraarticular fracture. This is the first step. Uh, and through medial approach for the medial triplane. Um, so for the lateral triplane, we mentioned that we reduce with internal rotation, we reduce with external rotation for the medial triplane. Um, recently, within the last couple of years, I like the arthroscopic assisted reduction. And I will show a case uh, soon. Um, complications. Uh, Commonly you see sometimes ankle pain. Most of the time I found it related to the hardware and screw and, um, and sometimes because of mal reduction. Um, extensor retinacular syndrome, uh, typically with the posterior displaced fractures. Non -union, mal union with rotation deformity is rarely seen. 
uh, anterior angulation or plantar flexion deformity also I see this rarely and valgus deformity can also happen. Uh, medial malleolus fracture unfortunately has the highest rate of gross disturbance and uh, I just seen one two days ago uh, risk factors uh, decrease it, a, it depends on the degree of initial displacement 15 percent increase risk of physical injury for every one millimeter of displacement um, can represent periosteum entrapment in the fracture site and this is, has been uh, published by a study by uh, Scott Mubarak, 2002 GBGS, uh, talking about the periosteum, and especially if the residual physical displacement is more than three millimeters. Talking about the growth arrest, it can be partial. Uh, uh, partial uh, arrest can cause angular deformity. Uh, distal fibular arrest um, can cause ankle valgus deformity. Medial distal can cause burrs. Because uh, the, the lateral side is, is growing, or complete arrest was, will result in leg length discrepancy. Uh, Physial bar resection is, um, is indicated if there is less than 50% of physial involvement and there is more than two years of growth remaining, and if there is less than 20 degrees of angulation. Uh, if it's not, uh, then osteotomy would be uh, the treatment, uh, and that has to include epsilateral fibular epiphysiodesis, and, um, and that fibular epiphysiodesis is kind of, of guided growth from the lateral side to help uh, prevent the virus deformity. To be uh, uh, said that uh, when we have physial bar uh, at the periphery, medial or lateral, causes more deformities than the central one. The other thing is uh, leg length discrepancy. If the physial bar um, uh, is less than 50% and there's more than two years of growth remaining, so the resection uh, can be reasonable. Um, if not, contralateral physiodesis as a timed growth uh, or timed physiodesis to get the growth matching uh, will be the, um, the proper treatment and, and it's, a, it's a different topic. There is now the application that you can get the timing of epiphysis is done through the multiplier or daily um, uh, app. Um, there are some, uh, some uh, evidence based about uh, using the, the CT treatment for TLO. Does it change your uh, management plan, it shows that it only changes the management plan in 4% or 4.8%. Uh, how about the arthroscopic assisted uh, uh, percutaneous fixation of triplane? Um, it's just a few patients, small power study. Um, I might have uh, uh, way more than this number, but uh, not published. It's uh, it shows that they, they go through the normal uh, follow-up, two weeks assessment, shows that uh, screws are good. Uh, to be honest, from my practice, it shows me uh, the, the only, the, ma the, the major advantage of using the scoop uh, and the ankle is, uh, it shows me other injuries in the cartilage, um, which is very surprising to see different other injuries other than the fracture itself. And that can make me comfortable saying to the family that the prognosis might not be good in, in your case. Percutaneous versus open. Um, with this study, it shows that uh, the open uh, has more higher rate of postoperative pain and that the need for hardware removal. That's probably when we open, we, we make scarring and that can cause pain. Uh, honestly, I, I don't see this high, high number. Uh, and from the study itself is not significant. There is a case I don't want to uh, keep you up late, but this is a 13 year old uh, young athlete who had injury of, uh, of her left ankle while doing gymnastics, complained from pain and swelling. Um, here's a fracture. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see in the AP, a vertical fracture uh, or in the lateral, but here's the CT she had the typical, uh, that's the typical, uh, you, you see the AP uh, um, and, and the coronal, you see the vertical fracture on the 
uh, sagittal, uh, you can see the metaphyseal fracture here. You can see it connected. It's a Salter Hairs 4 on the sagittal view because it's a CT scan. And you see the Mercedes pin sign um, on the axial. Uh, it's actually very, uh, very good example that it's hard to see. Uh, this case can be missed easily. Um, so what we did, we did the arthroscopic assist. You see the amount of cartilage damage inside? That's huge. Um, and then uh, we're able to do a, a percutaneous screw fixation uh, with the fluoro. If you look here, there's another talus uh, injury. And these cases usually come to me later uh, with a chronic ankle pain. And this is one of the things don't want to miss. Another 10-year-old uh, young, previously healthy, who had an injury of the left ankle uh, while playing hockey. And they're very aggressive with the hockey here in Canada. And as uh, they get a lot of crush injury, had this bad injury, and it's a peripheral, high risk of, uh, of physial bar. We mentioned this from the first moment. Uh, that is where we have elected between surgical and non-surgical, tried the cast. Uh, we had some voting. <laughs> We said, yeah, less than two, two millimeters, let's continue and ended in this. I've seen him two days ago, it's like preparing for this lecture and definitely has a bar uh, medially and uh, I sent him for an MRI to get assessment for the amount of, of the bar is at less than 50% then would prepare him for uh, physial uh, bar resection and uh, guided growth on the lateral side of the, of the tibia and the fibula. And uh, a treatment of post-traumatic pediatric ankle burst, deformity was physial bar, um, uh, bar resection and hemiphysiodesis is working quite good. Uh, so just resection of the bar and guided growth uh, lateral, as you see, there is an eight plate on the lateral distal tibia and also um, uh, at the fibula as, uh, as well, correcting the bars. Uh, if it's more than 50%, the osteotomy will be the answer and uh, maybe we'll complete the physiodesis. Uh, another study talking about, uh, 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 that's another thing. So go back to the studies, it's like comparing uh, using the fluoro versus uh, using the navigation system. Uh, there's no significant difference, but uh, now we have a navigator and we have an O-arm in our hospital. So uh, why not to use it as uh, detecting the bar as it's tricky to get the bar resection. Um, so uh, we're very close to the end. Um, just to mention some updates about the, the ankle fracture or ankle injuries in kids. There is an old statement saying kids don't sprain. So you, you get a child, have an ankle sprain, do x-ray, there is no fracture. We say this is Salter Hairs one of the uh, distal fibula or the lateral malleolus because kids don't sprain, their ligaments are stronger than the physis. That's why they get Salter Hairs one, even if you don't see it. Uh, uh, Bodis and Uni, uh, Oni Narayan in sick kids did the study and, and he did, he said, let's, I don't believe this, uh, let's do an MRI of these ankles and um, and then he found that 90% of the kids get sprain and not physical injury. So it's opposite to our old statement that we believed on. Uh, they tried to follow with another study, um, not to do a follow-up at the clinic with these kids. Um, so an ER, they put them in a splint and the patient takes the splint off once he feels better. Uh, I don't like this way, to be honest, uh, because of my practice as a foot and ankle, pediatric foot and ankle, I see a lot of ankle, chronic ankle instability in children more evolving than before. Um, so I, I follow the, so you use the immobilization with the splinting for a couple of weeks followed by intensive physiotherapy. Is there any value for the MRI in diagnosing injury after ankle sprains? I get a lot of calls from my friends in Egypt, they're worried about the, their kids, they get MRI same day, and actually the study shows that there is no difference. And I, I would say there is no need to do this, uh, to diagnose early uh, ankle sprain. I had a patient last week, mom was like bugging me to get an MRI for uh, an ankle sprain. 
Um, finally, this is the last slide, uh, I promise. Um, I see a lot of recurrent ankle instability in children. I treat them. Uh, and what's my finding? I haven't published on this, but finding is I usually see this non union of, uh, of Salter Harris uh, um, 3 of the distal fibula or evulsion fracture, which is actually connected to the ligaments and that causes instability. And most of the time, um, I know that the old fashion as people remove this and reconstruct the ligament, but most of the time what I do is I, I refresh it, fix it, um, sometimes with suture anchors, sometimes with the screws, and uh, I do uh, more of a kind of reconstruction of the ligament on top of this with, uh, with more plication. Um, also for all of these kids, I always start with ankle arthroscopy and uh, to assess the cartilage and uh, I see a lot of surprises. Um, the last one of them had chondromalacia, was a very bad cartilage on the uh, lateral aspect of the talus and articulation was, uh, was the distal tibia. Thank you very much. Sorry to keep you up and I'm ready for, for your questions. Thank you so much, Professor Walid. Uh, we are not so late, Professor Walid. You know, in Egypt, okay. we, uh, <laughs> we sleep <laughs> after 2 a.m. <laughs> that's, that's good. That's yeah, we are not so late. <laughs> in Canada, I think you sleep by uh, by 8 or 9. No, we're, we're, still, we're still keeping the Egyptian habits. I, yeah. <laughs> so, so we're the only, <laughs> the only family in, in our street that stays up. أنا حضرتك أول مرة نزلت ألمانيا يا دكتور وليد كان الساعة 9 بالليل فأنا فوجئت أنا أول مرة أروح ألمانيا فوجئت إن مفيش بني آدم في الشارع هو هو في إيه يعني اللي إحنا طبعا عندنا بنبدأ نشتغل بعد الساعة 12 بالليل مفيش مشكلة خالص وإحنا ستيل ذا سيم ثانك يو سو ماتش يعني محاضرة أكثر من رائعة دكتور وليد بي ثانك يو سو ماتش سير ثانك يو وي كان تيك سام كويستشنز بليز ذا فيرست كويستشن ليا بس سؤال الأول على السوفت وير اتفضل اتفضل يا دكتور اتفضل يا دكتور البي Software or program will be able to translation on a tool. Ah, I'm still asking Ahmed Ali. Still asking. What what what's the question again? The the program will be able to translation the voice to the Yeah, is it? Um, yeah, you can see it. Hey, hey, fan. Okay. As the daima daima ni yitla maaya ma al Zoom, but I'm 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 from the Zoom itself. لا لا مش بالزوم احنا عايزين أوه. سر بقى ده بالظبط <تصفيق> انا yeah, كنت yeah, حضرتك يا دكتور وائل بسال دكتور احمد علام عليه بقول له انا عاجبني قوي البروجرام ده اه يمكن انا الـ الـ يمكن انا عامل السيتنج لان عندي ام ماك ماك كمبيوتر ميبي ذا سيتنج از از فروم ماي سايد بس يا اتس انتريستنج Uh, we have a question, uh, Professor uh, Walid. Uh, a 12 years old patient with delayed diagnosis TLO fracture about three weeks post trauma. What's the best treatment for this case, in your opinion? So, so uh, again, if it is uh, displaced more than three millimeters, uh, I still go ahead and, and do open reduction uh, within three weeks. After three weeks, uh, it's very hard to be like healed and and we see what luck we will get. But uh, three weeks still, I can do. I can go inside and um, and and we we'll be able to do a reduction again. Uh, we have uh, no other questions, Professor Walid. But we will see you when we take the word because you are with us in the case-based discussion program. In shallah, we will start. Yeah. That 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 word from you that you will be with us. Yes, of course. In shallah, Dr. Walid.